Um, let's say you want to add a song to your Spotify game page. You can add it from your phone. Other people see that and they add it to their Spotify database that they have on their phone. Now let's assume Spotify comes up with a new feature, like video. They want to add video features. So it comes up with that new feature. You download it. You download the latest version of Spotify with video. Um, but your friends don't do that. They have the older version. Now let's say you want to send your friend a video link. Because they don't have that upgrade, the latest Spotify, that way they get an error. So that error in hard forks, in networks, is what we call this consensus uh, you know, split and stuff. So that's why in this example, we need to coordinate with everyone in a decentralized network in order to agree on something, on like when do we activate those features. Um, so we have a lot of factors to do that, and we call this whole process a hardcore upgrade stuff. Now, what are hardcores? So hardcores are can be classified into contentious and non-contentious hardcores. Um, contentious ones would like a DAO, which uh, split the network into Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. Ethereum Classic fund fact used to pay my bills. <laughs> and then you, you remember the Bitcoin block size wars? That what really you know, resulted in Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. Um, for non-contentious hard forks, for example, Ethereum had the London hard fork, and Ethereum had multiple hard forks before that. Um, in these kind of hard forks, we call them network upgrades, because everyone agrees on that you know, features that improve the network. But Celo, the latest one is Donut hard fork, which I coordinated a few months back. And yeah, so there's a few um, differences in hard fork coordination Versus proof of stake hardware. Um, with proof of work, you got it like, at, you know, it's all about distribution of your hash, which is where everybody's going to join you anyway. There's no minimum, maximum of stuff. Uh, as long as the miner is mining on a chain, that chain continues to exist. Um, and there's no limit. It's more involved and more difficult to coordinate because the hash power distribution is like, as long as you have a device, you're mining, maybe you don't have your phone, but you're hard way to communicate with you and you're continuing to mine from an old chain while people are upgrading to the new chain. In proof of stake, um, specifically delegated proof of stake or IDFP, it will require the form set to upgrade. Um, so the form is 2F plus 1 and F is the full form, the tolerance number. Um, if you assume 100 validators in the network, um, F can be 33. So here you need 67 validators out of 100 um, to upgrade in order to have successful hard fork. If you get below that number and then that hard fork block gets activated, the network stalls. We do not want that. What is that? Uh, yeah, it's Istanbul is something called Thomas. It, um, it, it was built by a uh, consensus form or KPM form mm -hmm. that, and it's really popular in um, like enterprise solution and um, a lot of like, you know, simple proof of stake, uh, staking um, consensus mechanism. Uh, Celo back to IDFP. Um, as a matter of fact, I heard an awful lead that um, from the owner team that IDFP2 IDF is in the works and it might be released and stuff. So it's probably going to have even better performance than IDFP1 and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, it's like, yeah, perfect. Sorry, I just can't do it. I mean, what are the characteristics of IDFP? Yeah, no, so.
want to minimize your exposure possible for several specific use case because um, five second block time means like all oh, an instantaneous payment um, in an emerging market. If it's 15 seconds, somebody's like on for pace for something. 15 seconds might be like, oh, why are you paying too long? But five seconds is like near instant and stuff. And uh, like, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, like the, the, um, like the bottleneck is on, like the way that VFP works is you have, it's like a really fancy round robin where you have a set, you go to each set, one person becomes the block producer, they submit, um, like a proposal, okay, hey, I'm going to submit this block, people say, cool. Oh, you know, two thirds have to say they don't all good, send it back you know, for confirmation, then they do it repeat it again, but like for not the same, you know, I'm gonna propose it this time, like oh I'm for sure gonna propose it now. And they do that same kind of cycle again, confirm it, and then they repeat that. So that set three cycles um takes about three seconds. Uh -huh. And that will be the most popular for some people. One second. One 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 second. What one second? Cool. Um, and then I think there's like some other thing that we're looking into, like in um, BLS and for like optimizing and stuff. Or yeah, I mean, so that's right now we have 110 validators. Mm -hmm. um, there's a short term limit of 150, but we do need to scale that. Cool. Who are the validators? Sorry? Who are the validators? So we have like some like, like institution, uh, institutional players. Yeah. Uh, like Bison Build and like, you know, we have Model Chain, uh, Figment, which is like a lot of education. And then we have like about 53 independent validators who are like their own group that only have one validator running and stuff. And like, yeah, um, they're super well connected. Um, they're very passionate about the mission and they're like, my favorite part, they're very responsive. Um, compared to mining tools, they don't really respond back on time. It's like really good for coordination. Like, coordinating with validators. I just feel like, yeah, I mean, like, um, they're more invested in the network, I feel. Um, like, with mining pools, they just want to, like, they don't care, they care about, you know, how many people are joining their pool and stuff like that. And it's, it, like, they kind of don't as much prioritize this kind of thing. But I think that's more like in the past, and now mining pools are doing a better job of being on social media and stuff and being more connected and stuff. But, like, I've seen, like, a hardcore, like, the Atlantic Sparkboard on Ethereum Classic, which was based on, um, I think, Constant and Local on Ethereum. It was like that. Um, I've seen, like, after months of, like, coordinating with Apri, um, and, you know, sending out the messages and all that, there was, like, still a miner mining on the wrong chain, and there was no way for us to be there. And it was mining for, like, a month, and, like, they're not even noticing, like, and yeah, we, we can also cover that later. I, there's a great option, you can go 100% coordination and stuff, and if like, there's a way where you don't have to stress about it after a while, you know, you can yeah, only have to do your guys and stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, there's like, yeah, difference in that, and we do different types of part work in this field for the specification process. So I'm gonna briefly touch on the EIP concept, which I think is what, you know, invented the idea of, oh yeah, Oh, sorry, just one more question on yeah. IBFD. What, what made you guys choose IBFD over Click or Hotstuff or anything that existed? Yeah, that's a good question. What was your design process around that? You were there. Um, so, Click is not a BFT algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, so, it's like kind of a testament, testament proof of authority. Um, so, it just kind of actually up to snuff. Uh, and in terms of hot stuff, uh, it's very experimental. It's kind of leading edge research. Uh, it's definitely something that I've like, looked to looked into, read the paper, like thought about it a little bit. Uh, this is a lot of just production writing. Uh, and there's actually some things with hot stuff like on the team it looks really good, but if you dive in deeper, uh, there's some other trade-offs in there that are a little harder to work with. And then there's a couple like implementation details that they completely skipped over in the paper that they can actually be tricky to actually implement. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of some assumptions around how to do a particular step, which gets them the really good as and what I've been at this, but in practice it's hard. Okay, thanks. And, and it is, uh, what are you doing? Is it similar to Pyramid in the sense where like, you have one block uh, economic finale? Yes, that is pretty similar to Pyramid. So, uh, they're all kind of based of PBFT, so it's a similar kind of complexity. There's one 
find subtle difference with how what they do called proof of block change, and then we have kind of a different mechanism, but that's big, that's cool. But in like a normal case, uh, no ground changes, it's very, very slow. And, and clearly, y'all's, uh, did you get, did you implement the integration into the app, or was that like a standard um, it was partially completed. We did a lot of work to kind of improve reliability, uh, mm -hmm. fix some bugs uh, that were pretty bad bugs that were in the original implementation. Uh, and then the one that uh, so they, uh, they fixed it yet. <laughs> really, in, in the core of like proper, they have not fixed the bugs. Yeah, that's the last week. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Although I'm new, I am petitioning for the next 
nice cardboard. Um, we had to call it espresso and gain a press record down for that. Oh, okay. We love coffee. <laughs> and yeah, um, after you know you test it on multiple network, um, um, and when you activate it on on mainnet, what you're doing, you want to deploy a smart contract with your friend back and then use the new feature to test those and stuff. So you test it multiple times. A with a deep, like a, a thermal temporary GBM testnet and B with public test nets and stuff, and with that work, that's when I go to main now and stuff. And yeah, now we're gonna go after testing from coordination strategy. So we spoke uh, yeah. Sorry, this is like a single moment before the testing phase, but it is, um, I'm curious, how do you think about implementing hard forks with like, without adding a bunch of technical data? Like, when you look at the get code phase, you see, if hard fork equals x, do this, and you know, it just like kind of gets unwieldy. So I don't know, I'm just curious how y'all think about that, because it's like horrible. <laughs> yeah, you want to talk about technical tests, we have a lot of opinions on that. Yeah, I think it just kind of comes with the game. Um, you want to be careful with the changes that you introduce to kind of keep them localized. At this point, like the EVM's kind of built in a way that it can deal with different uh, hard force behaviors. Um, and then there's the regenesis idea of putting around, uh, which means you could get rid of that, but that's a whole lot more in coordination. Now that there's much traction there. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so, coordination kind of strategies is. Um, what what I saw work is like what we talked about with validator, you know, building a database uh, or even Excel tree of all the validators and mining tool companies under a contact information. It's very important. You can't do a hardcore coordination without knowing who are your block producers or your contact information. If you don't have it, uh, the best thing to do is try to reach out and try to get somebody over there, your contacts and stuff, to be able to contact them and keep them posted every now and then. Um, and after that. Having a contact at all the changes that create your opponent. And the reason for that is because if they're running a node, um, they have to be upgraded to the new hardware, or new version that would upgrade the hardware, you know, to the hardware. Um, because a lot of users are creating that point and stuff, and you don't want to disrupt it for the users. Um, having a contact with all the adaptive users and running their own nodes. So that's really important if you have a if you're that popular app, so like this one. Um, that have a lot of users and stuff, and if they're running their own node, making sure that those that popular that are playing their nodes as well. And finally, node provider services. Like if you're, I think it would be other one in that node and stuff, like all these that are providing nodes and stuff, um, like block daemon and all that, making sure they're on a new version is super important in terms of like coordination strategies and stuff. And, and yeah, how much, how much time do you um, with Cello, I felt like it was not that much because at least with the validators, um, it is super straightforward, I feel, mm -hmm. um, because they're very responsive and engaged and stuff. It takes longer with exchanges because they have a really crappy DevOps practices <laughs> and, you know, they care more about user trading than like, oh, you know, uh, just hard work, whatever. Or sometimes when you say, hey, we're, we're, going, we're having a hard work, they think that, oh, you you're saying you're going to split the network. Like, no, 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 we're just upgrading. <laughs> <laughs> oh we're just upgrading, and they're like, uh, and then it's like there's a lot of this communication back and forth, and um, yeah, depending on the exchange, like, I don't want to be an exchange, but for what it's worth, <laughs> Coinbase is really good at DevOps. Like, I mean, they they have a lot of good practices, and it's like always been easy working with Coinbase, at least for them to upgrade their nodes and stuff. And that's the only one that I like. Work for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, to build it, yeah, we have another question. I guess um, so there's, there's exchanges, there's um, validators, and then service providers. Right. right. And service providers have been pretty good as well. Like, um, yeah. Um, I think because with service providers, um, they really care about what's happening on a core level from what I've seen. Um, at least, especially if it impacts your user and like their operation and stuff. So, like for example, in Ethereum, um, a lot of people in the community we don't 
necessarily attend the all or death call or don't really maintain any client are still interested in 1559 because it really changed the whole game for a lot of people, right? Including um, the service provider and the DAS and stuff. So um, if they're like basic things, you're like, hey, this is a new opcode that not a lot of people might use. I don't see, like, it doesn't necessarily mean that those service providers are going to care about that specific thing necessarily, but it is like a big thing that can change the whole game. Yeah. But either way, they're like, they can be super responsive and stuff. Um, generally, a lot of this is community management as well. Like, you're um, making sure that the people that you're in contact with, they, they're aware of everything and stuff, and that requires a lot of coordination and stuff um, to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Um, but yeah. And then, actually, now that I go to the AA plan rule that I was talking about earlier, um, so what I found that really works. Um, distribution of half power, distribution of quantum. So, when I'm talking about the eight plane, it might not apply actually to the quantum, but like, I'm talking about half power. Um, when you do coordination, you try to see which mining will control 80% of the half power. And you try to be capital, and that probably takes 20% of the effort, right? Like, for the better distribution. Um, but, I mean, with quorum, you have to hit, like, an hour case, 6 to 7 now, here, got 100, and that secured the network. Obviously, you want to go close to 100%. And the point is, you can't hit 100% right away. There's always, like, we talked about that mining pool that continued mining on the old chain. I mean, for a month, it's, it's hard to really, like, go after. At some point, you got to cut your losses because it's a distributed network, and in distributed network, you can't do 100% coordination. Well, this is just kind of like a philosophical kind of question. I'm curious if you think um, some people might say that uh, it's a good thing that it's more difficult to coordinate with like the block producer or validators or whatever. And uh, it's, it's convenient when you want to like push out upgrades like, consistently. Um, but if it's easier to coordinate, then like the downside is like you might have uh, block producers that are doing like sensory attacks or like uh, reorder attacks. Mm -hmm. So we're just kind of curious like uh, uh, how you feel and like you see like a spectrum kind of trade offs in that space. Yeah, so that's a good question. I do agree that it, the, uh, I do agree that coordination is the cost for the decentralized and it's a worthy cost because at the end of the day, you want to have a decentralized network and it should be difficult. Although you try to minimize anything that are like redundant and stuff in like you know coordination strategy, but yeah, um, it's definitely good because you don't want to keep like you said you don't want to keep pushing out upgrade and people just keep adopting upgrade and stuff like that. Um, as well, if it's a contentious upgrade and stuff, like 1559 could have been contentious, like, you know, and then it becomes like, okay, they don't want to support that new chain, um, anyone will, because they're, you know, it's still, it's like very profitable to do so if you, you know, might have decided not to, there is going to exist a free market for it that allows our people, and that's, I think, the beauty of the decentralization that, um, because I've heard a lot of critique, for example, people like, oh, why do not like 1559 they can mine on the old chain? I'm like, yeah, but there's going to be a big opportunity for a new miner to mine on a new chain. Like, who wouldn't, you know? And that, like, that's the point, you know? Like, it's a free market, let the free market play it out. But yeah, from a philosophical point of view, I think it's a um, As long as they respond to their email, like, reasonably, it should be a good thing. <laughs> but yeah. Um, but yeah, that's it. Did that answer yeah. your question? Did anyone have any questions? But we can talk about like the uh, volume and stuff. So the simple is the same the same kind of rule apply. Well, to, to cover the final thing about hash power, like with the remaining twenty percent of the hash power, that's the long tail of the game, and these are the smaller individual miners or solo mining people or folks who are like retail miners, like a new term retail miner right now in this space. Um, these are the folks that you want to do a question on Twitter, like mailing lists and stuff like that in order to reach out to them. But because they're the long tail, it's hard to expect 100% um, upgrade process. Um, the distribution of volume of uh, centralized exchanges. So in this strategy, the same 80 20 rule of five. I like, like when I do it, I look at the, the top uh, exchange by volume and I just go for the 80% or so. And as long as those are free, you don't need, need to just, you know, lose sleep over the chain that has, you know, like a random chain with like $20,000 of volume in every 24 hours. Even though you should tell them to upgrade and stuff, you don't really 
have to push it too much because the reality is you want to minimize disruption for the majority of your users. And if an exchange is too slow to operate, even though you've done their due diligence, you reached out, you've done the responsible thing, at some point, you've done it now, you know? Mm -hmm. so, um, the so same thing, so yeah. Sorry if you answered this already, but how much time do you allocate towards hitting the 80% of yeah. all of these? Yeah, so yeah, uh, but with the 80-20 rule, um, the idea is like, because like, the biggest exchanger and the biggest mining pool, they control like 80% of the half hour of volume, they take 20% of the number. Because they're like the well-known exchanges, like for example, it's Coinbase, it's Binance, it's Bitrex, it's so, they already have, you know, you have content information. Oh, sorry, oh, let me say it another way. Um, how much advanced notice? Oh, advanced notice can you get them? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So, um, assuming the testing week um, would be, let's say, one month on an affordable testnet or one month on a public testnet, and then one month on another public testnet, and then one month later you activate our mainnet, we better um, give them a month and a half. They need to run, you, you signal to them that it's happening, but like you only reach out to them like a month and a half to like, catch up, the new version is coming, it releases time, and that one, like that, you need to upgrade to that client. And that way, you, like, and it, it, you can start very passively, you know, to start emailing them, you know, reaching out to them and stuff, um, or to let them know. And then later, during the weeks, what you do is you get a bit more aggressive in your um, um, outreach. Like, yeah, you tell them they need you to upgrade, and, you need, and, and it's not like, yeah, we'll upgrade, and so you'll be like, okay, and that's it. No, you gotta ask them for, like, can you confirm that you've upgraded? And that's really important because a lot of them will be like, yeah, you know, like, we're gonna upgrade, don't worry about it, but, like, it's the kind of thing you gotta be really aggressive with, like, or just, like, be, like, very thorough in how you get them to upgrade and stuff, so yeah. Yeah. How do you deal with like auxiliary tooling that's not necessarily running middle, but may rely on like network behavior? Like 15 well, like times if you earn stuff? What's up? Like they rely on like, that node provider and stuff? Uh, well, I'm thinking more like things like Web3.js. I don't know what the tooling for Cello is, but like 1559 is a good example of Web3.js and there's all these things have to upgrade to support these new transaction types. Right. So how do you guys signal that? Because like one and a half months for some changes in some tools may not be enough in terms of dev time if it's not you know, clear yeah. many like months before that. So one and a half months is more for like the people writing a note, right? And not necessarily for the wallet um the you know the wallet providers and stuff who might have to keep in mind that this new hard work is gonna come up kind of gonna come with new things happening, right? For that, that happened during the specification freeze, but when you like you know the signal boom those are spec users, this is the specification that we're gonna do. And that will give everyone some sort of idea. If people are following what's happening on the core level, will give you some sort of idea what's coming. And that will make people aware, like, oh, with this new hardcore, there might be new transaction types and stuff. And that will be like it will allow them to understand that. Like, you know, play, you know, plan out for that and stuff like that. But like that the one one and a half months is only if you're like running a node and you need to be on a new version rather than what's included in that new version, which would be communicated much, much earlier. When, like how far out do you try to target like a spec freeze? Is um, there any like thing you guys try to target or is Yeah, so I mean assuming you have a specific date and everything is ready, we spent we do the spec freeze um a month before we we, we assume like that when the testing, all the testing will be done. And then like two to three months to make an activation, we conclude the thermal testnet testing um, and like the public testnet testing and then main that testing. And like, like main that deployment and then you can still have a test after main that. So we so do like four months. Like, so three, like, yeah, like three to four months. And we specified it really well, like in a three to four month kind of you know, um, process, but like ideally three to four months. Um, but I assume, you know, that everyone agreed on the features and stuff, and you're completing them to allow all the client to develop. With Cello, it's much faster in the end because we have one client only. Sure. But when you have multiple clients, that's even another coordination on its own. And like, Tim Baker does a really good job there, like, does the Lord's yeah. work and stuff. And it's like, it's fucking the hard job. You know, especially when you have multiple clients, different languages. Um, Multiple clients are notorious for not necessarily following each other's specification, not necessarily on hardware, but on, on many things. Like, for example, like Open Ethereum, or used to be called Parity, had different RP 
RPC endpoints that are specific for parity that are different than it, for a GAP, for example. Another thing that is a state inconsistency between both clients, and we experienced that in EPC like a year ago during the 51% attack. Apparently, parity and or open Ethereum, they have a reorder cap number that is different than GAP. But they assume they would never hit that on Ethereum, but it's really, really expensive to hit that reorder cap level. Um, and it's something like, yeah, but on GAP, it's much higher than that as well. Um, and they don't want to change it and make, and make it that gap. So you have a lot of things that are not necessarily specification on the CIA, like the EIP process, but more on the client level yeah. that are inconsistent with each other, but would cause a state change, for example, and stuff. But yeah. Um, and fun fact during that 51% attack on ETC last year, um, because of the reorg cap, what happened, uh, the attacker did a reorg cap higher than the reorg cap for parity. So what happened, all the parity nodes were went offline, there were two networks. Like, and funny story, when that happened, um, it, would, I would, it would a Saturday night at 4 a.m., guess who called me? Hudson Jameson. He's like, yeah, but like the network is splitting two. <laughs> and they're like, that really wakes you up. Like, That's not what you want to hear. Yeah, no, you want to hear on a Saturday night, like, you're kind of sleep, but like, it would really good, like, you thought it, like, you know, it would, like, you know, up and, like, a few people are drunk, and, like, we practically loved it. And the way we mitigated it is we tried to find a percentage of you know, that were on parity, and we tried to get them to go away from parity, like, or to, like, we sent their notes because um, it wouldn't connect to the main app because, like, there would be an error when, uh, in the reorg, it wouldn't accept that reorg, it's higher than the cap for some reason, right? Um, I mean, not for some reason, but that, I don't know if the attacker did that on purpose. I don't think they did, but like, it Do you did. remember what the cap was? Um, I, I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure I can figure it out. Okay. I can pull it up. Okay. Um, like, it's like different, way different than that from the or cap. But it's a fun fact, like, that, and, and like when we talk about reorg differences, you can technically split the network and do given enough hash power or hash power tree, right? It's pretty good. Are you guys um, planning to have a second client developed in the near future, or are you like one client only for a while? Um, so, I think there's a lot of debate on one client versus multiple clients and stuff. I think there's a trade-off to be more in, in both cases. Um, but like, I think having one client and one dedicated for development can be good, like for consistency or to minimize disruption that would be cost from like reorg or like, you know, Potential uh, state uh, uh, inconsistencies yeah. um, due to having multiple clients. However, a good reason to have multiple clients would be multiple development teams, multiple implementation of the protocol, and uh, this, like it helped decentralize it a lot more. However, even though there are multiple clients, GET still dominates in terms of how many nodes are being run on GET versus like Parity or Nevermind or Hyperledger Desu and stuff. Um, I think like the same would be like you know following like the example like I do the whole eight when you go through a certain like we send like a changer application by user account like the Uniswap and stuff like what are the most popular applications go for those make sure they're created um, all node providing services it, like th this is my favorite because um, if you just contact Infura and you contact like that node and stuff, that kind of take care of every, most people, because most people rely on like if you're on stuff, so it's cool. Um, and even like that, that's the thing they connect to if you're on. Alrighty, um, so I think yeah, we have a few more points, but like engagement strategy, like, here's what works for me. Um, I, I run a weekly mailing list um, with updates that are bullet pointing and with action items, and these include like, all the different software upgrades that are happening, how to upgrade to them, what are the action items, what the release date, and stuff like that. Any forum posts that might impact validators, anything related to government, to the improvement process, and stuff like that, to keep people up to date. And it's not really a blog or anything, you don't have to write much, but like it's more like if you look at you know, about what happened in the week in Ethereum, a simple mailing list that's like weekly, or uh, you know, sent weekly and stuff is really easy to do. Like minimal amount of work. Um, I started off with like, um, like a new subscriber, you know, when I launched it and stuff to get out there and pay. And right now we're like at 400 people. 
people subscribe to your mailing list and stuff. We could like like passively, we didn't really promote it or anything. We just like if you want to keep up to date with everything happening from you know hardcore or darkness or <coughs> sorry, uh, whatever. Um, a lot of people are interested in that. We call it like the core community, like you know or the profile side of thing, and like we find like the mailing lists that are really simple. Um, people are more, much more engaged, especially if people like validated reminders are connected to multiple Discord, and there's a lot of different channels in each Discord, and trying to keep up every week with what's happening is a lot of work, right? Um, but with a simple mailing list, you can engage them really easily, and a lot of them like they're interested in that kind of information because. Um, I got a lot of feedback for that, like, for example, by Simple really appreciates it because they're dealing with multiple networks. Um, a lot of people try to figure out what the correct version of the software do I have to be on, and they look at the mailing list, your email, they see what the latest version and that helps them, you know, uh, stay up to date, on, you know, stay up to date and stuff. Um, yeah, then we allow for one month approximate block candidate for mainnet. Now this might not be really the proof in Ethereum because the proof of work, because it's probabilistic, if you like whatever you estimate the block number to be and what the time is, it might be different in, in reality if you use the probabilistic nature of block production. In Celo, you can predict it uh, very precisely just because we have a fixed five second block time and stuff. So if you know the exact time that the you know the hard work happened on, which is cool because that allowed me to create like the donut hard, like the hardcore watch party at a specific date, like a specific time when people can just watch, do the countdown together and stuff for the hardcore. And it doesn't like accidentally it. set it at 4 a.m. your time, so you have to wake up in hardcore your whole network when you're groggy. Yeah, I mean, like it happened in group of work where, like, I think there was a, there was a scenario where um, we assumed in UGC last year, like, um, the hardcore was going to happen on Tuesday, but then you like, like, you know, the block were coming in faster, it turned out might happen on a Sunday, and nobody wants to do a hard work on a Sunday. <laughs> 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 like, Sunday, like, you know, the rest are hangover, not to, like, form a hard work. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, um, it, it does happen and stuff, like, or, like even at 4 a.m. and stuff, on a Sunday, I think that's like, really, really, really yeah. happens. Um, and we mentioned solid and explicit, you know, confirmation of upgrades. So one easy way to do that, if somebody told you they upgraded, tell them to call that RPC endpoint that would get you the version number of that tech node that you're mm -hmm. And we provide docs or something. It's very really easy to do for them, uh, for the validator and for the um, a node operator and for developer. As long as they confirm, they say yes, I'm on this version explicitly. That's it. You know, you've done your job. You can you're ready, you mark them up as ready, you move on to the next staple for the stuff. And uh, yeah, uh, asking for a verification of the release of the um, So yeah, like, we spoke about um, like one month main activation, but the whole idea here is um, you get everyone upgraded like a month before, everyone says yes, and then sometime in the future you know that this block number will activate on a specific day and stuff. Fun fact, this actually happened two days after my birthday and they called me out like, why don't you do it on your birthday? I would not want to. Yeah. Or they have hard work on my birthday. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, so, yeah, I mean, so this assumed that one uh, doesn't activate the network uh, feature. It happened one month or two weeks, like depending on who the last person to upgrade, and then at that specific log number, everyone is going on a new network or activate the new feature. Um, we also, like, there's a lot of cool toolings and stuff, like hardcore toolings. Um, Ethereum used to have, like, the network core finder, um, but I, I couldn't find it anymore. I just wanted to actually make making for the new Ethereum classic hardcore. It's happening, I think, in a few days, Magneto, they call it. Um, so if you're talking, like, hardcore monitor, a lot of you can see the distribution of hash in multiple different clients. Um, like in Ethereum, like get open Ethereum and stuff. And it's a good practice to have it in multiple different versions of it. To crack down, like, if the older version, what happened to the older version after the hardware and stuff, and like to monitor the node and stuff. Um, Next up, you're really good. Like, if you have a bunch of nodes running and stuff, like, you know, you're monitoring if everything's okay on the next step level um, is super important. Um, what I like to do 
is uh, monitoring nodes. So having two nodes running, one on the old, uh, like on the older version, one on the hard fork version, and seeing what happened in real time after the hard fork, what changed in that older version, like if there's anything. Because what would happen is um, the old nodes should get, start getting bad blocks because if getting them from the new node, which has like the new transaction type, and it's still cute, like you did that, you could be still connected to those new nodes, the new hard fork node, but it can't process those transactions because they're from the new hard fork blocks. Uh, like the, they're from the new hard fork uh, version and stuff. Um, so yeah, that's a really interesting to see that, you know, to see, oh, the, you know, like the old version of going haywire, kind of <laughs> and yeah, um, and finally, post work. So what happened in post work? So one thing is, after hard work, the network doesn't really activate, like to the new hard work, to the new feature, you have to trigger it, technically. So if you have a new opcode that you want to test out, you have to, you have to submit a contract, a smart contract with that opcode, opcode and activate it in order to trigger the split, because otherwise, the old node and the new node are still on the same chain, and you would have to go pop that split the chain, you know, split the chain and stuff, you know, with that simple thing of like the state chain. Um, and yeah, considering no one running on the old chain, it, it's more like it's really hard to do, but like it's definitely somebody doing it not responsive, but yeah, it's something that anyone should, anyone should box out for. And yeah, um, one little show that like, we have to cross chain Solana and Solo because we want to bring peace with all the different layer on proof of space. So if you're all in here till Friday, please visit and stuff. We have a push event happening on Friday and stuff. But yeah. Uh, thank you. And if, I'm here and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any.
pretty well. You can kind of do this thing ad hoc as things become ready. And yeah, it is. I think that's a great question. Um, so I think with Cello, um, uh, a lot of people were diverse about Brenda coming in okay. for the first part for them. And like, you know, I came into the picture, you know, to like coordinate that and stuff, given my experience with EDC or going out for stuff. Um, it would be easier to part for to work on that because uh, you know I get the consensus is like really easy. like you know, like a round robin <laughs> kind of logistic and you have a forum set you don't have to worry about minimal you know my majority and you know minority chains anymore and I think with that kind of scale yes it will be a bigger challenge to try to coordinate more but like I think as long as you're maintaining contact information in a database of every new entrant into the C including the node operator it would like you know it's a way to funnel them in and one of the ways to mail in this the other way is like you know engaging with them on Discord or stuff um, but yeah it's definitely more straightforward and a work hard work but that has. what do you think about like fixed forks throughout the year like mm -hmm. say Cello does two forks a year one is in July one is in January or something. Because um, like right now, I don't know how this is supposed to be the cello, I assume that it's like more ad hoc and we have this feature we want to do, let's figure out what we need to do the hard fork, that's the same way that Ethereum does. Yeah. But you kind of end up with this thing where, like this is what happened with the, the London hard fork. And I had planned to come out to Berlin so I could be on CET for the London hard fork because mm -hmm. I was awake at like 3 a.m. for the Berlin hard fork. Right. And then they were like, oh no, let's do it in August instead of July. So now you have poor devs who like can't go on vacation, can't have anything going on in their lives for like one month at a time because they don't know when things are going to fork. Mm -hmm. But you have to balance between, we really want this upgrade, and if we miss that upgrade slot, like do we just push the upgrade or do we like push the feature to the next upgrade? Yeah, um, I, I believe as well, um, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think when Arrow used to have that model, right? It's like, um, oh, really? like, I think they had like once every year, at least it's not very hard for it happening. Yeah. Like, for me on it, like, it's like decentralization, like, you know, hard for it, and you have that focus. Um, I, I'm not like super convinced that um, having a specific date is necessarily like, like, it's going to add any benefit. Um, because um, look at it from like the difficulty bomb in Ethereum right now, right? That bomb, like the like, difficulty bomb is supposed to be reset all the time and stuff, and the way you like, remind folks that we're going to make the proof of stake, right? But two, two or three times um, it would, you know, set up and like there was no hard work. Like, but the latest one was we were placed here. Yeah, and, I don't know how they forgot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's like, and if you look, if you look at the chart, um, like on EtherScan, like how many blocks are produced a day by Ethereum, like when that drop happened, that's what it did. And and everyone like, yeah, everyone kind of forgot about it, but like the miners don't even say anything anymore. They're like, yeah, you know, like whatever, you know. They're like, so rich, like who cares? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, because of that, and because anything can go wrong in this system. Like I believe when you have that like complexity to complex systems, um, you know anything can go wrong. This is still like you know um, like a really hard you know stuff that we're working on, right? And having a specific date that you have to be committed to can be uh, you know something that can be a bit dangerous in my opinion, like it, it, in some ways because um, let's say there's something that can activate and there's like it might have security vulnerability and stuff like that. Um, so having flexibility to push off upgrades and stuff, although it's kind of like a bad experience or stuff, because by the time you activate it on two test nets and on a kernel test net, you you're saying that you know I, I know that this you know feature activation will result in a like semi like successful network upgrade if you assume one hundred percent of people agree to the upgrade, right? Um, but if if by then you find like this consensus failure for like the security vulnerability, I think it could be flexible and like push sure. it back. Yeah, so, they have to be flexible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean like I think the St. Petersburg one was like the one that got delayed and stuff that got pushed back, I think like a year and a half, two years ago. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. I, I think it was like a proposal by the week.
Like, it's funny because there's like half a dozen people in the whole world that to, like coordinate our work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but everybody does. Wow, this is so like. What is everybody like? Hard to hard to 